All right. So good, ev good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this ReCheck Consumer and Retail Webinar. My name is Aurelian Mir. I'm Director of Corporate Finance at ReCheck. For those of you who don't know us, ReCheck is an FCA regulated platform offering advisory, research, and origination services through its curated network of senior independent finance professionals. We help both institutional investors and corporate clients to source, research, and analyze investment opportunities <coughs> and raise capital. Today, I'm very happy to host three senior ReCheck advisors who will discuss their views on the sector and the impact of the crisis on decisions investors are facing. I have the pleasure to introduce you to our speakers. Claire Kent, who spent 20 years as an equity analyst covering retail and luxury, and the last 10 years as an independent consultant. She's currently sitting on the board of Prada SA and co-founded Ifley Road, an online men's premium running wear business. Stacy Widlitz, who spent the last 20 years analyzing the evolution of global retail trends as equity analyst first, and in the last 10 years, as founder of SW Retail Advisors, a retail consulting firm providing institutional investors with non-consensus equity investment ideas. Andy Hughes, who spent 35 years as an equity analyst covering the retail sector, of which 26 years at UBS, where he was the head of the highly ranked non-food retail team. Before we start, I'd like to highlight that the views, thoughts and opinions that would be expressed by the speakers belong solely to them and do not constitute investment advice or recommendation. Everybody in the audience will be on mute, but we encourage you to ask questions via the chat functionality. The format will be a short presentation by each speaker, followed by questions, and we'll take questions from the audience at the end of the three presentations. I will now hand over to Claire, who will present her thoughts on the landscape before, after the virus, the winners and the losers, and how consumer behavior will change after the crisis. Over to you, Claire. Thank you, Aurelien. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I'm looking forward to a lively discussion. So as Aurelien mentioned, um, I'm going to just touch upon two areas. Uh, firstly, the landscape we're expecting post-virus, and then secondly, the winners and losers in the consumer sector. So in terms of the landscape post-virus, my real theory is that the uh, virus has just been a catalyst of what would have happened in the retail sector anyway. By I really mean that long before the virus, the sector was struggling. It's struggling for a number of reasons, but just to quickly touch upon them. Firstly, online uh, retail or e-commerce being, you know, a real, real, marked a real change in the sector. It resulted in like lower football um, within shops. Secondly, there's the whole issue of retail and leases and the whole challenge of running profitable stores. And then the third reason why retail has been so difficult for so many companies is also because of the relation with wholesale and the fact that wholesale, you know, low profitability, no control over pricing or very little control over pricing um, and, you know, just generally a lot of control of brand. So the sector was already struggling pre the virus. And I think as a result of the virus, what will we, we will see is number one, fewer clothing retailers and department stores. Already in the last few weeks, we've heard that companies such as Cath Kidston, Oasis Warehouse have gone into administration along with department stores such as Lord and uh, Neiman Marcus. So that in itself is something which I think would have eventually happened. That change will result in fewer physical stores. We're already seeing the high street getting emptier and fewer store, boarded up stores. 
some people predict that in the US alone, after the first, there will be 15,000 fewer physical stores. The second change I expect to the virus is that e-commerce will actually benefit stronger. I'm not necessarily talking about DTC companies which have unicorn status, because I think that that whole sector uh, has just reached you know, uh, false valuation, has grown too quickly, and profitability hasn't been prioritized. But I'm talking about you know, solid e-commerce companies who really have understood profitability. Us will benefit from fewer competitors overall and fewer physical stores. The third change I expect is that the cash rich luxury goods and retail giants will rethink their channel mix. Uh, a lot of them have actually been relatively reluctant to embrace e-commerce and have still continued to prioritize store expansion. So I think one chain is that these cash rich giants will actually focus more on e-commerce in the future and understand that ch consumer is changing. And the other thing I expect the cash rich giants to do is to rethink their market strategy. There has been such an emphasis on celebrities and influencers over the past five to 10 years. Unfortunately, I think that that will change mainly because we're thinking their market budgets, but also because I think consumer change, I'll talk about that in a minute, and therefore the whole allure of celebrities and influences is no longer the way it was uh, pre-crisis. So let's now quickly look at the potential winners and losers from this situation. Well, in terms of winners, um, Re-commerce is an area which has actually held pretty well during the whole virus. Re by that, I really mean the resale of used luxury goods. Uh, we already saw in the past few uh, companies managing to actually raise capital and also relatively strong sales. And I think maybe it's true that if people want luxury goods, that they will be, uh, you know, prepared to buy them second hand. The second area which has I see as a winner is sportswear and loungewear. Firstly because people are working from home, they want to look smart but they want to be comfortable. I think that that's an area mm. which could continue to be strong because I definitely see more home work in the future and into that area is also sportswear. And I'm sure you yourselves have noticed in the UK that there are a lot more people out there running and exercising using their allocated exercise period a day. So I think sports companies uh, will benefit from that. But obviously, it's only the e-commerce part of business which benefits because companies like Adidas and Nike also have lots of physical stores and that, that's obviously very painful. Uh, shutting those stores. And then the third area uh, which has benefited, not surprisingly, is exercise equipment, home exercise equipment, but also, you know, bikes you use outside. Brompton, for example, really, uh, announced uh, an uplift in sales during this period. And just to conclude on areas such as books, indoor and outdoor games, uh, one good laptops, all those sorts of businesses which are sold online by Amazon have actually benefited very strongly this period. Moving finally to losers, uh, I see the loser really in this whole uh, area being fast fashion and I would say discretionary fashion. Firstly, because people will have, you know, have less money going out. And also, I think the whole lockdown has made, made people really, really question fashionary items and whether they actually need goods which they're going to throw away in a couple of months. And the second big loser is travel accessories. You know, companies like Away, which I'm sure you know of, have a 90% sales decline in the past month. 
uh, because obviously one is telling no one needs to buy new suitcases. What I think is very interesting is that I think that the whole trap business will completely change in the future. So I don't think this is just a temporary thing. And my final words now are just to quickly mention the quoted sector. Obviously, the biggest beneficiary in the sector have really been food companies and retail. Within the non-food area, Amazon stands out because, as I mentioned, it actually sells a lot of those products which are really benefited from this uh, virus, be, be it books, be it electricals, be it laptops, but they really, really focus on that area. Companies like net porte and Next, they have on the whole not closed their warehouses. Uh, within the luxury sector, it's just worth pointing out that the real standout has been Hermes. Uh, firstly, Hermes is very focused on classic items, you know, the real antithesis of fashion. Um, and the, uh, Hermes reopened their stores in China, reported that they saw a uh, very decent sales uplift. So that's really uh, all I was going to touch on. I'm also delighted to answer some questions. Thank you, Claire. So you mentioned a landscape that is changing, consumers that are changing as well, channel split, that would have channel balance that would have to be um, rethought. What do you think consumers will, will value more and will value less going forward? Um, yes, I think that's a very interesting uh, point because I think that the lockdown and the virus has really, really massively changed people's mindsets and that the four things which people will really care so much more about post than they did before is number one, friends and family, number two, their own health, number three, the environment, and lastly, you know, social issues such as homelessness, the issue of migration, labour rights. And I think that's such a different mindset to pre the virus. In terms of, I think people care less about, uh, I think, for personal economic success will be less important. Uh, materialism, because our virus has really woken people up to the fact that do they really need that many cheap dresses, that many cars? I just think it's really changed people's mindset. Uh, third, the influence of celebrity culture and influencers. I think people now see that as something which is incredibly appropriate and superficial. Um, and lastly, and I think travel is such an interesting area because no longer will we probably fit from cheap fares, you know, being able to arrive at the airport an hour before the flight, uh, you know, the number of airlines we have. I think it's going to be completely different, much less pleasant, much to travel because of the waiting times it will take to actually board the plane. And also, you know, the cost of travel, I think, is just going to go up so much. So I, I really see values, consumer values as having changed enormously. Do you see a, a return to normality at some point or a form of normality after social distancing measures are phased out or a vaccine is found? Uh, to be honest with you, without wanting to smonger, I don't really see things going back to what we would call normal because I, I think that firstly, as I mentioned, people's values have changed. But apart from people's values having changed, everyone is going to have much less disposable in everyone because whether it's that they've lost their job or their employer's not as well. Also, I think like, you know, the wealthy middle class is going to have to pay much higher tax rate in the future. So I just think that you know, we won't go back to normal. And I think that the biggest, you know, the biggest area which will suffer from that is what I would describe as discretionary luxuries. Whether that's your takeaway £3.50 cappuccino every morning, or it's like fast fashion, it's just stuff you don't need. You don't need it. And that's why a company like Hermes is so different, because, I mean, you're buying a beautiful piece of craft which has taken 
you know, 15 hours to make and it's something you could pass on to your children. And so that's completely different. I don't call that discretionary luxury. You mentioned the big, uh, you know, big, big companies, cash rich giants um, that will need to rethink the channel split. What do you think that means for smaller companies, the challenger brands? I think challenge brands are actually relatively protected because the thing about a challenger brand, it has been successful and grown through thinking out of the box, through doing differently and not just, you know, like on digital advertising or digital advertising. It's really grown by like thinking differently. And a lot of those challenger brands are now helping during the virus by, you know, putting, you know, the medical masks or something which stops the actual virus. And I think people will appreciate that. Obviously, how each challenger brand does depends a lot on which category they're in. And there are categories which are going to, you know, be stronger after the virus and some which will be weaker. On the whole, I think the challenger brand sector is okay. And you mentioned the, uh, you know, as part of those challenger brands, there's the, the D2C, the direct to consumer brands. Um, you know, some of them seem to be winning, others seem to have run into problems, possibly problems that were there before. I'm thinking of the Warby Parker of, you know, any vertical brandless um, stock business just before the crisis. Um, outdoor Voices. Um, had, has had some issue, issues during the crisis. Casper pulled from um, the pulled from Europe just after an IPO in February. So, what do you think will happen to you know the, the Warby Parker of any verticals? I mean, I'm honestly incredibly cynical about companies who chase sales growth at the expense of profitability, and I think that the whole problem with that sector you're referring to is that it's just all been about sales growth. As we know, you know, the costs of acquiring a customer are incredibly high due to all this competition. And if you cannot recruit customers profitably, you, you just won't have a future, whether there's a virus or there isn't a virus. It's one thing which always remained a mystery to me with these very, you know, with, the, with these unicorns. But I think in terms of the individual companies, it really will boil, boil down to number one, which product category are they in? You know, I'd be much more skeptical about a company in travel than I am about a company in, in another area, for example. You know, secondly, is there any real product creation? Is the product any better or different than competitors' products? Because a lot of those companies you're talking about, the product in itself was very similar to what already existed it was about the channel to market um, and then you know thirdly how much cash does the company have and you know lastly how much cash are they burning through so I, there will be survivors and there'll be some who don't survive but on the whole I'm very very cynical about chasing sales growth at the accessibility. Thank you so much Claire. Um, Thank you. I'm now going to hand over to Stacey, who will share her thoughts on the dynamics between wholesale and retail, but also the situation between brands and landlords, and eventually um, about what the recovery uh, will look like. Over to you, Stacey. Thanks. First of all, thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here um, with uh, two other speakers who are um, household names in the, in the retail uh, analyst world. Um, I just want to start by saying, you know, it's really important to point out that, you know, on the U.S. side, 70% of retail is small business and small business employs half the workers in the U.S. And, you know, this just accelerates the process, like Claire was saying, of the big get bigger and the small die. Um, you know, we've already seen that from the impact of uh, business loans with small business being squeezed out, even though the loans were supposed to be for them. So, you know, I think it's a matter of we're looking at an opening schedule now. We're starting to think about that. What does that look like? But if we do get a re-emergence, a, re um, a second round of, of the virus, you, you will see 
a significant portion of retail wiped off the map. I mean, we've heard from the public companies, you know, getting rid of buybacks, dividends, hunkering down, cutting capex to the bare bones as much as they can do to survive. It's, you know, we've really seen the stress test listening to the department stores um, and everyone else say, great, you know, if we have to pay rent, we have three or four months, that's it. That's all we can survive here, these big public companies. Um, but I wanted to today go through some of the trends that were already happening that are now accelerating be because of what we're going through. And the first is the rift between wholesale and retail accelerates what I call the breakup, which is already in progress. And, you know, we all know that the department store space is just a sea of sameness and the only distinction is, is price. And those don't work in this environment. They didn't work before and they're certainly not going to work after this. We watch the battle in the US, Macy's, JCPenney, Kohl's fight their brands and try to keep them from promoting them and throwing them under the bus. Um, you know, the second half of this year, we're, we're gonna see fire sales. So you're gonna see that relationship really come to a head. Uh, I think the retreat from some of the brands out of wholesale will be not just the obvious suspects that we've heard about. Um, it will expand to luxury, as Claire said. I think, you know, we've even heard from, from Caring that was saying, hmm, Maybe time to accelerate the consideration of where we really want to be distributed. Um, so for the luxury brands, they maybe take this opportunity to accelerate that and and own their their brand and not let the wholesale kind of degrade them um, and do more e-commerce, as Claire was saying. And of course, you know I think DTC is is going to have its day as, as an accelerated pace. And those who are not prepared to handle the transition are just mm -hmm. going to lose their moment. And, you know, we've heard from companies that are so successful with loyalty and apps, and that's going to be a game changer. You know, we heard from Starbucks that the app and the loyalty is becoming so important going forward. I think the next one is we're talking about, you know, forget just brands breaking up with the wholesale channel. You're now going to see brands take the opportunity to close stores, even if they don't have to. Um, we heard so much in the media about uh, the landlord versus the retailer. Who's going to pay? We're not going to pay. We're not open. It's your fault. It's our fault. Whose fault is it? Um, you know, I think we're talking about store openings again. Simon Properties is opening. Some stores in Germany are opening. So, you know, is that a way to get the retailers just to pay their rent? And let's face it, even when stores do open, you're talking 20, 30% of normal volumes for the first wave and then maybe half. So I think over the long term, REITs will have to come to the table and malls and the rent structure completely has to change. We've seen that in the UK with the CVA process, whereas, you know, they gave everybody breaks in distress and then the healthy neighbors went, wait a minute, well, you know, now I want 30 or 40% off, I have leases coming up. So when you take down prices, that becomes really sticky. So I think we're gonna have a lot of interesting conversations about what the real estate market truly looks like. Um, I think also that, you know, landlords are gonna have to face the fact that even for healthy companies, they're probably gonna end up closing 20% of doors and unhealthy close 50% or more. Um, restaurants are a bigger issue, so capital intensive. So it's not easy for them just to ramp up and then ramp down. If we do get a second wave, you're gonna see a huge amount of restaurants wiped off the map. Um, then the next thing is, you know, again, let's talk about re-entry. Like, what does this look like? Think about um, products that are intimate sales, like makeup that you test, you try on. Think about small format stores you can't possibly allow traffic flow in there. So by nature, you know, they're gonna look at 20% of their traffic flow as the new normal until there's, um, until there's a vaccine that's gonna have to be regulated, that traffic. And you know, I was talking to somebody, they were saying, well, in China, they've got a million people that they've hired to come in and scrub the stores every time a person comes in. We're not China, you know, the US and Europe, we have to pay, we're paying workers and we can't have that many people physically come in and pay that many people to scrub the entire store. Um, so I think also, you know, we can't forget that customers, the mall is supposed to be, or the high street, it's supposed to be leisurely and fun. And now someone's gonna stick a thermometer in our mouth, even if, you know, the retailer can, can buy one. That, that changes the experience. Um, and then I think, you know, as I alluded to, it's the, the second half of the year is, is it's going to be a fire sale. So the off price channel wins. 
TJ Maxx, TJX, you know, Adidas has talked about the fact that they're not ordering anything for their outlets. They're just going to flow down what they already have into the outlets. Again, you know, Caring hinted there might be some select markdowns. So um, I think particularly off-price channel wins, um, you know, Alibaba opened up an outlet business. So that, that kind of tells you what it's going to look like. And, you know, I think also we're hearing from a lot of brands that they're talking about carrying over product to next year, kind of just let's forget this season and just throw that same product in the store next year. Next, um, the UK retailer put some numbers around that and they said about 15% of next year's buy will be replaced by this year's product. So some other retailers are alluding to it can be much higher. I doubt that the nature of fashion is, is that it changes and that's, that's what inspires people to shop. And then lastly, I think, you know, we talk about costs and people. U.S. retailers have raised pay. They're giving hero pay raises. That's sticky. You can't take that away. So also, I think an, an, another issue that people underestimate is the unemployment insurance is so much higher in the U.S. and it, it will last through July and perhaps longer. So it might be hard to get people back into the stores. Some of them are going to make more money staying home on unemployment insurance. And, you know, a lot of them just don't want to risk themselves. So I think costs are going way up. And Starbucks, you know, quantified that to, uh, yesterday. They're, they were talking about um, they were losing 50 cents on every lost dollar because of the increased costs around security and safety. It's gone to 80 cents on the dollar. So you have all those had all those headwinds even when we do reopen the question is what kind of demand will be there and also what kind of demand can we control from a safety perspective so i think those are kind of the the conversations around um what the second half of the year looks like yeah exactly and you know it looks like potentially in the us um the measures in place you know we, we, as you said will help a bit longer than here but clearly the question is what happens from the outcome of the negotiations between brands, wholesaler, retailers, landlords. Um, could you give us your view on, you know, what that second half of the year uh, will look like? Sure. I think, uh, I think that traffic, again, even when we're fully open again, is probably down 30, 40% still, even into holiday. I think that's the case until we find uh until there's a vaccine and people feel truly free and comfortable to touch things and try on things and put makeup on their face so many purchases are experimental and i, I think that's a big issue i think for e-commerce you could see the mix go up to 40 percent for retail that's normal a lot of retailers already have that so that could go up to three quarters also you know as we talked about you're going to see this whole fire sale of of just product we're going to be just floating in in discounts. So for the consumer, maybe that gets them interested again, at least back in the stores and gives them a sense of urgency to shop. Um, that, that would at least be a, somewhat of a positive. But I think, you know, we're going to see the bankruptcy wave really start because right mm. now it, it can't start. We're in log jam. You can't value product. You, you just don't know what the world looks like. So you're going to start to see that in the second half of the year. Then again, into next year, we've got this huge flow of discount product as bankruptcies roll in. So, um, not a particularly uh, rosy outlook for the next 12 plus months. All right. Putting consumer to the side and looking at investors in the markets, we saw yesterday on the back of the news that the, you know, a potential um, cure uh, was found for the coronavirus. We saw a rally on the back of that. And, um, you know, large cap stocks growing 5, 10, sometimes 20%. How would you play? the recovery or whatever looks whatever seems to be a recovery um right now so i like to look you know i'm focusing on what is 18 months from now look like maybe we do have a vaccine then so who comes out the other side of this really strong on the apparel side it's inditex you know what do they do what's their business model their business model is is to chase rather than load up on inventory like every other retailer, which is ordering six to nine months in advance, they, they, because of their supply chain, they chase into it. So they can control their margins better than anybody. So they come out this, you know, the biggest gets even bigger and the small guys shrink out. Um, the other one is obviously the off price. So TJX, they will be able to name their price for amazing product. And then, you know, on the US side, um, Target, 
which is so advanced in terms of um, buy online, pick up in store, curbside, they're meeting the consumer they want where they want to be met. And of course, as Claire mentioned, Amazon is going to take a massive share during this time. And do you see the recovery playing differently in Europe versus uh, the US? Well, I think the, the US went into this in, in a much healthier position, but you know, healthy has been wiped off the map in a, in a matter of four weeks. But I do think it'll be interesting, again, as we talk about the landlords versus the retailers, do they come to a place more of collaboration, which you're, you're starting to hear those conversations now. So because the US is mall based and Europe is more high street, I think that the malls can assist the retailers, the small, medium and large size ones. And what does this look like? Here are regulations of how to clean, how to deliver, how to go do curbside pickup. They can assist. The, the retailers under their roof on how to do this. Whereas I think um, in Europe, perhaps on the high street, you're kind of going it more alone um, rather than as a group. All right, thanks a lot, Stacey. Thank you. Uh, we're now gonna hand over to Andy. We'll share his views on how retailers are coping and also uh, what investors um, will focus on in the short term. Over to you, Andy. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Aurelia. It's a pleasure to be here as well. Um, just to kick off with uh, your first uh, question in terms of what we're seeing from retailers. I mean, clearly it's um, a very fast market. We're getting uh, one or two results a day and have been for the last week or so. But clearly the pattern is that food retailers and online retailers have been absolutely swamped with demand and non-food retailers are really locked in this desperate battle for cash flow and to conserve cash. And just to put some numbers on that, even for uh, March, which was only um, including one week of the lockdown, uh, UK food retailers probably added a billion pounds worth or so of sales. Um, so uh, a double digit increase and non-food retailers uh, dropped about three billion pounds of sales. So that was about a 20% decline. Both of those are going to be magnified um, over April and, and possibly May as well. And the response clearly has been very different. So the food retailers have been, again, desperately trying to cope with demand. Um, not easy in this environment. So they have been incurring a lot of extra cost. So that's the uh, whole safety issue, online growth and uh, how to uh, pick uh, more online orders from store. Uh, wage costs have been uh, rising as well. So uh, all of those extra costs have been incurred. Fortunately, they are benefiting from the business rates rebate from the UK government. So really what we've seen from the likes of Tesco and Sainsbury so far is that profits will be flat to possibly slightly down for uh, FY21, which is not a bad result, particularly when you look at the food, uh, when you look at the non-food retailers. And what we've seen from, uh, from them is really waking up to find their cash flow has disappeared. So if you look at what uh, AB Foods was saying about Primark, 650 million pounds of sales per month disappeared pretty much overnight. Um, all their stores uh, closed and uh, still are closed. And their cash burn was 550 million pounds per month. So even if you've got a rock solid balance sheet like AB Foods, that's uh, something you can't cope with for very long. So everyone has moved into emergency cash saving mode. Any item of the P&L, um, any item of cash flow, um, benefiting from any government measures. Uh, some companies have uh, tapped their RCFs, some have raised equity, but it's really a battle to uh, stabilize your cash flow. And clearly that's going to have knock-on effects outside the sector, just as we saw in the, uh, in the credit crunch. A lot of the focus immediately was on what the retailers were doing, but... Uh, if you're an advertising agency, you're probably going to struggle. John Lewis has said that they're going to cut the marketing budget by £100 million uh, this year. Um, if you're a Bangladeshi apparel supplier, I mean, UK retailers have, have cut £2.5 billion worth of orders already just from Bangladesh for the rest of the year. So uh, life is going to be difficult there. And as Stacey was saying, for the REITs as well, um, very, very difficult for them, um, particularly at the March quarter day, only around about a third of uh, UK retailers actually paid their rent. So uh, the, the pain is definitely getting past 
you know, up the chain to uh, to others. Um, in terms of the, uh, the the outlook, I mean, day by day, as retailers report, it's it seems to be getting gloomier. So, um, if we look at what Next was saying, it, um, in mid March they were saying that hopefully second half sales, you know, would be would be flat. Um, now they're saying that even by Q4 you could be down over 20%. So, what was their worst case in mid March is now. Um, is now nowhere near their central case in terms of sales decline. So definitely um, the lockdown going on for longer and even when stores do open, you, you may well have this situation where footfall is going to be very, very low. And, and something which is you know, perhaps coming to the fore now is, is it more expensive to open a store than to keep it closed? Um, so once you open a store, you're pretty much on a bound to pay your rent once you open the store your staff come off government furlough schemes and you have to pay them yourself so it may well be that stores don't reopen and this this is the catalyst for what we would have seen anyway and that a lot of stores you know, won't actually reopen um, the second thing is in terms of balance sheets um, any company with a, a set of uh, results coming out particularly a full year results they have to pass the going concern test so whatever their worst case scenario is they have to prove that they've got sufficient cash flow we've seen a handful of uh, share placings already marks and spencer passed on its fy21 dividend uh, this week as well as uh, the fy20 payment so so when you go to the banks and, and seek either additional finance or, or waivers on your covenants the flip side of that normally you will have to give something back and that that normally is no dividend and or some equity uh, issues um, as well. So um, it looks very much to me like a, like a muted recovery. And although, you know, the stock market can get very excited about vaccines and so on, that's not really going to be an issue until the end of the year, maybe early next year. By then, a lot of the walking wounded will, I think, have, have, have fallen by the wayside. Um, and how that flows through to um, to, to winners and losers. Um, clearly, we've got to allow for quite a significant recession. So um, disposable income, I think, is going to be uh, under serious pressure. Against that, um, as Claire was saying, the, the spending habits are going to change very much, particularly uh, ahead of any successful vaccine. So in the UK, one third of consumer spending was on the, you know, what's called the experience economy uh, and that's been growing very very strongly over the last 10 years so uh, you know one third of uh, of spending so that's travel leisure entertainment restaurants hotels is, is going to remain difficult for the foreseeable future so offsetting the recession risk is is perhaps a flow back of spending um, into other areas um, food retail is clearly one of the biggest beneficiaries if uh, if eating out remains under pressure so more calories are going to be eaten in the home um, if you're going to the food store, you're likely to buy more non-food. So the, uh, the hypermarket format um, may well be more popular um, going forward. And the, uh, the store pick model that they have might actually be more economic. I mean, some of these food retailers have been adding 50% to, uh, to their online capacity. So uh, that, that may well bring over time additional efficiencies into the, uh, into the system. Um, and, and I think in terms of uh, online retailers, you know, clearly, you know, uh, big winners so far and likely to see behaviour change towards an acceptance uh, of, uh, of more online ordering. I, I wonder whether a lot of the brands that might disappear nominally will actually become virtual brands. So we've seen that already. Karen Millen, uh, Karen Millen into administration bought by Boohoo is now a brand on the, uh, the Boohoo. Uh, platform next is pushing very hard with third-party brands it's got something called total platform where effectively next does everything for you apart from your design and possibly the sourcing but the whole website management customer interface is handled by next so I, I think the, um, the the name of the game will be fulfillment so who's got the best fulfillment platform and who can reach more customers efficiently with that and, and it'd be interesting to see whether you know, Zara finally cracks outside China, certainly, and actually buddies up with any of the aggregators uh, that we've seen. Certainly ASOS in its uh, results uh, a couple of weeks ago didn't rule out 
the fact that some of the bigger brands who uh, who hitherto shied away from aggregators may well um, may well uh, follow other brands and uh, and go down that route. Um, last point, I, I suppose, as Stacey was saying, on value retailers, if we are heading into a recession, uh, then the value retailers may well win, particularly if there's a lot of mid-market clothing market share to uh, to pick up. So we've seen Primark in the UK, very successful, 20% close on now of volume market share in the UK. The format seems to work in other markets. And, and in most of those other markets, is only really scratched the surface. So... Uh, uh, value retailers like Primark and then finally the home as well if we're all sitting in our homes thinking about where do we put the laptop where can we work quietly we've noticed that uh, you know the decoration is a mess that needs doing in the gardens a mess um, it could be time for the DIY retailers to actually so to make some hay so it's been a difficult few years for Kingfisher uh, but now they have the opportunity I think with, a, with, with the market there for them and, and through the pain barrier in terms of their um, their supply chain program to uh, to actually go for it in terms of uh, in terms of market share in, in 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 the UK and in Europe. Thanks a lot, Andy. I'm going to ask you a few a couple of questions before mm. we can move on to questions from the audience in the last fifteen minutes. First one, we touched we touched on taxes um, with. Claire, and you know, question for you: uh, mm. Will taxes go up? Mm. Yeah, th this is this is where it gets depressing. Um, I, I think we can split what's happened in terms of government finances into two. Clearly, every government has taken on a huge lump of additional debt to uh, to get through this crisis. So, you could look at that UK figure: two hundred billion, two hundred fifty billion uh, of that sort of order. You could look at that as a one-off increase in debt necessary to get through the crisis and and sort of forget about it and and hope that growth will uh, bail you out of that increase in in debt just like it did after world war ii um, the problem is it looks like the structural deficit is going to look horrible um, so if we get this big increase in unemployment uh, and lower corporate profits clearly the government tax take is going to go down and their structural costs in terms of uh, social welfare including uh, healthcare costs, social care costs, debt service costs are going to go up. So it looks over the medium term, you know, unavoidable that you're going to get some, some, some quite serious tax increases. And clearly the, uh, the better off have to sustain that either in terms of higher income tax or lower um, tax um, benefits such as pensions um, or corporate taxes have to go up possibly you know one interesting one would be to change corporate tax so it's uh, levied on EBIT uh, and not on pre-tax profit so that would get rid of the uh, the benefit that debt has as a as a tax shield and maybe that's the right thing to do to uh, help companies uh, move away from debt towards equity and this crisis obviously has, uh, has shown those companies with excessive debt you know, are the ones that are really struggling. We've already seen the, uh, for instance, entrepreneurs' relief um, being being cut down in, in this year's budget, mm -hmm. and you know there may be there may be more. Uh, thanks, Andy, for for that last question. Mm -hmm. Before moving on to the audience, it's about sustainability, which has been a key topic for investors. What do you think will will change going forward? Mm. Yeah, it's a, an interesting one because there has been some talk that with obviously companies under pressure, consumers under pressure, that. <laughs> Uh, will somehow row back on sustainability, but I think the momentum is is, is far too great for that. Particularly uh, stakeholders, whether it's consumers or, or shareholders, it's, it very much. Uh, I think that's going to continue. And again, as Claire was saying, that we're, we're all um, sitting here thinking, you know, the air is cleaner. We're not uh, got so much pollution. Um, you know, what do we need in terms of uh, uh, of excessive consumption? So, uh, so I think that the um, on sustainability, I think it will just be, be all systems go, um, or continue to be all systems go from uh, from here. And, and again, on that question of sustainability, you might uh, ask the question about companies' balance sheets as well. It's that they they've got to be sustainable um, in terms of how they operate, as well as uh, uh, as well as the wider sustainability issue. Thank you, Andy. We're going to move to the uh, questions from the audience, and one about, um, you know, a system where shoppers would be given an allocated slot uh, to shop by invitation through apps, for instance. Perhaps 
Daisy, do you want to to expand on that? You mentioned Starbucks had an, had an app loyalty system. Are we going to see more of these um, technologies? Yeah. So I think the the reopening process so far is the the first wave is curbside pickup don't come in the store. The second wave um, is just that. So that's what some retailers are already talking about. Tapestry, Jones Coach and Kate Spade talked today about the next wave will be by appointment. So there'll be one or two people in the store at a time. So Starbucks through their app, obviously you can order your coffee in advance and they set up a little table outside and your coffee's there waiting for you. So you don't have to touch anybody or go near anybody. I think that's, that's the future here is that you're, you know, those who can speak to their customer and make that transaction transaction happen in a safe and efficient manner that's that's where more of the technology have to go and those who haven't invested in it need to catch up quickly yeah got you and another one about the, the physical retail shop front again um you know what's the experiential change uh, or experience led um, you know, what would be the changes in, in the experience, for instance, hair salons, co-working spaces, gyms, artist studios, um, there are physical space meant for people to gather there and, and, and now they, they can't, they can't exist anymore. So they have to rethink, um, they have to rethink how they are. So perhaps Claire, do you want to, to take that, that question about the future of experience led um, areas? I mean, I think that experience will remain important, you know, overall because at the end of the day, retailers and, you know, consumer goods companies in general need to find a way to get people to actually want to go to a physical place rather than having everything at home or delivered to their home. So I think experience as a whole you know, will remain important. But I think the problem with a lot of the businesses, types of businesses you've mentioned, like gyms in particular, you are just in such incredibly committee to other people. So I think really, you know, until there is a vaccine, I, I think that lots of those areas, beauty gyms, gyms exercise classes, I think they're absolute no-goes there is a vaccine. And um, a question on the supply chain. Andy, you touched on uh, you know, the Bangladesh supply chain for the textile industry. Uh, there is a broader one from a few people in the audience saying, you know, how will power move in, in the supply chain going forward in, in retail? Sorry, I missed that. How, how, will, how will what move in the supply chain? How will power move along the, the supply chain? Right. Which, which side is going to win? Which is... Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, it depends on the, uh, on the industry. Again, with, with apparel, um, you know, uh, a, a, a lot of flex um, that the big retailers have in terms of moving uh, supply between markets, certainly on a, a 12 to 18 month view. So if there is more capacity available in, uh, in, in global manufacturing, that might give the larger retailers with rising market shares you know, a little bit more power. Um, in, terms of, uh, in, in terms of durables, it's different, particularly in electricals. It's, uh, it's the big um, brands and the big manufacturers that, uh, that, that have all the influence. Um, they've got all the cash as well. Interesting that Dixon's were talking about some of their their big suppliers uh, accepting longer payment terms um, to, uh, to to help their retail partners. So, it depends very much on the uh, on the industry. But if, if anything, it looks like the uh, the balance of power again may switch more towards the retailers, particularly if you get uh, consolidation or further consolidation in apparel. There also looks like there's going to be a big fallout on the vendor side because you look at what these brands and retailers have been doing to their suppliers. I mean, behind the scenes, they're canceling orders until they were called out in the media. They were not going, you know, in, in some cases, just canceling, that's it. It's on the problems yours, not ours. You think about the cost of raw materials, the stuff's already in production. Often 
things are paid when they're shipped, things are stuck in warehouses because there's a backlog, they're crushing their, their vendors. So you also may see fewer vendors when we come out of this, manufacturers. And already, let's think about um, the manufacturing was moving out of China to Bangladesh and Vietnam. And if everybody was already chasing that, inflation in those areas might have already been on the way. And then all of a sudden now we see a, a smaller base of them. So it'll be very interesting to see how that plays out. But, you know, again, like a lot of the brands have done the right thing because they were called out. One of the one of the comments here, you know, in line with what you are saying, is, you know, retail survivors may may actually um, walk away from proprietary distribution and retail space and will outsource all of that. Um, so, I don't know how it would play out, but is that? Do you have any thoughts on that? Basically, people, even people surviving, just not not having stores anymore. Mm. Well, I think I think. Uh, certainly the big retailers will will have some stores. I mean, there will still be shopping locations that people will want to visit, you know, the big centres, which are a combination of leisure and retail, and, and particularly if a vaccine um, is found. Um, but even ahead of that, larger store formats, as Next was saying, they will start, when they're allowed to open, they will start by opening their larger stores where social distancing is easier you can extend opening hours to uh, to, to get um, customers through in uh, in, a, in, a, in a longer opening period um, the next customer base likes click and collect or has has traditionally liked click and collect over half their orders by volume a, a store pick up so uh, so I think there will still be um, room for stores um, over the long term but if you look at the numbers, there's still there's no equilibrium there. So uh, if in the UK, non-food retail sales, about 30% of that and rising is now online. And that's really happened over the last 15 years or so. We haven't seen a 30% reduction in floor space. In fact, we've hardly seen any reduction. So there's still you know a lot of pent up um, closure potential for the, uh, for the sector. And, and it feels like, again, that the landlords don't have much of a backstop, as Next was saying, in a lot of their locations, that the rent would have to fall by 40 to 50 percent before it was worthwhile, the landlord switching from retail use to, uh, to residential. So, so rents could come down a long way. And I, and I think, again, that's the, the next answer to that question is very much, you know, asking about how much floor space there will be is the wrong question. The right question is, how low will rents go uh, and, it, and it does look like they're just heading south very rapidly. Thanks Andy and you mentioned click and collect one question uh, from the audience for Claire perhaps do you think click and collect could apply to a luxury brand? Um, let me think about this um, I mean the luxury sector on the whole has been incredibly reluctant to embrace e-commerce and you know even today if you look at for a, co a company like you know um, they don't even sell their leather goods online I mean they sell all leather goods but they don't sell you know, many of the leather goods you could find in the jewelry sector on the whole is way behind in e-commerce where other retailers and consumer companies are I think like click and collect is not something they're thinking about right now, but as a general rule, click and collect is a very, very good thing because it really encourages to actually see more product uh, and, you know, possibly to exchange rather than get a refund. So the simple answer is I do not believe in thinking about click and collect, but I think that it's a good thing. It's maybe something they should think about. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, all three of you. Thank you, everyone, for following us during that webinar. We're going to wrap up here. I'm really sorry. There's a few questions I haven't, haven't been able to, to ask our, our speakers, um, but we have to wrap up. Um, Claire um, mentioned, so in, in her presentation, talked about, just as a reminder, the post landscape that would be really different with you know, fewer stores, fewer players, 
stronger D2C companies and the cash rich giants um, push to rethink their channel split, re commerce, loungewear, sportswear, exercise equipment likely to emerge as winner, fashion, travel accessories as the losers. Things won't return to normal, according to Claire, as social distancing is set to continue until a vaccine is found. Um, and more, more taxes, higher taxes are likely to kick in. Post lockdown, she thinks people will focus more on core values such as friends, family, health, environment, and less, eco less economic success, materialism, celebrity and culture, celebrity culture and travel. Stacy talked about the breakup between retail and wholesale, which is likely to accelerate and extend to luxury. D2C will be a winning model for the ones, for those that are prepared, and brands will only break up with wholesale, but also landlords. Recovery will be difficult for smaller format stores. In the second half of 2020, we should expect a de decrease of footfall in the vicinity of 50%. Second half of the year will be a fire sale with limited inventory carried over on to next year's season. And expect winners to be the likes of Inditex, TJX, Lululemon, Target, LVMH, Nike. Eventually, Andy talked to us about non-food re retailers that are desperate to replace the lost cash flows. That food retailers have seen a huge increase in cash flows. The main issue is to maintain supply. And in the short term, investors will focus on earnings and dividend for food retail and cash burn for non-food retail and leisure. Grocers, pure plays, durable retailer, value retailer are likely to merge as winners. Taxes are likely to increase in the long term, um, as the increase in debt to GDP ratio may not be offset by higher growth um, this time round compared to other crises. And with sustainability likely to continue, um, despite some people suggesting that companies and households are under pressure and will, um, will not focus on sustainability as a core business priority. So, that was a summary of the hour spent with you. Thank you so much again to our three speakers who agreed to participate in today's webinar. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Andy, for sharing your thoughts. Thanks to all of you who have been able to attend the webinar. And we hope it's been helpful and you've had valuable insights into the current situation. If you have any question um, about the webinar um, or if you want to speak with any of our speakers, please feel free to reach out my direct email address, which is am at reachx.co.